like this last year tell me what I missed cause I feel that it's coming back up again must be something I ate some song some show some hate Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our Faith and Fire conversation. Uh, we are so happy to have you uh, participating with us at the, this timely for this timely conversation. And at this time, I am Reverend Dr. Leslie Copeland Toon. I serve as Chief Operating Officer for the National Council of Churches, and I am just overjoyed, really, to be able to participate in this conversation with Dr. Martell and Dr. Miller. Um, and really to talk about where our, susten our spiritual sustenance comes from in a moment like this. Uh, certainly we know that we need to be fortified both in prayer and in spiritual practices and uh, for this journey that lies ahead of us. 2021 has come in roaring um, like a lion in so many ways. Uh, that might not be the right analogy, but certainly uh, if you haven't been on your knees yet, uh, we uh, invite you to that space of making sure that you have the spiritual sustenance that you need for this journey. So I will turn it over to my colleague, Minister Christian Watkins, and ask that you introduce our panelists and get us started. Thank you, Leslie, for that introduction. And it's good to be here with you all. Um, peace and blessings to you all from Washington, D.C. I am Minister Christian S. Watkins. Um, Justice Advocacy and Outreach Manager for the National Council of Churches. But before we begin, um, let us engage in prayer. So let us pray. Good and gracious God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer of our lives and all things under the sun, we give you thanks and praise for another day not promised. We give you thanks and praise for the struggles and successes in our lives because through you, it all will be perfected in the end. We ask you to touch every household represented here in attendance. We ask you to touch the ones who will be uh, viewing this conversation after it is all said and done. Move through this conversation in a mighty way, oh God, so that your power can be recognized in unfathomable ways. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. These things we ask in Jesus' name, amen. And without further ado, I would like to introduce our two magnanimous uh, 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 panelists on the call with us today. Um, we have none other than Dr. Lloyda Martell. She is the Vice President of Academic Affairs and the Dean and Professor of Constructive Theology of, at Lexington Theological Seminary. And we also have my professor, my spiritual formation professor from Perkins School of Theology, uh, Dr. Heidi Miller. She is currently the director of the Master of Practical Theology and assistant professor of practical theology at Pfeiffer University. So with that being said, I wanna jump right into the conversation um, from both of you all, your opening comments. Where are we right now? Um, where, where do we find ourselves in this current state of affairs here in America and throughout the world house. Um, yeah, what, what, what say you? Dr. Martell, you wanna go first? Well, good afternoon. And good afternoon to everyone who's listening. And I really wanna take a moment to thank uh, the Reverend Dr. Leslie Copeland and uh, Dr. Christine Watson for extending this uh, invitation to participate in this. Uh, esteemed panel with my colleague, Dr. Heidi Miller. In 1967, um, Martin Luther King had a speech uh, uh, and he titled it, Where Do We Go From Here? And he, and he posited the following statement. He said, in order to answer the question, where do we go from here? We must first honestly recognize where are we now? And in light of the events of 2020 and, uh, and as we face now this looming violence initiated in January 6, 2021 in our nation's capital. I have to ask, how do we move from here and where is the here from which we need to move? This past year, I've heard the repeated references of the twin pandemics. That is to say, the novel coronavirus has highlighted the pandemic of racism. 
I would put to you today that racism is not a pandemic. That is, it, is, it did not suddenly arise and spread globally. <clears throat> Rather, racism is endemic uh, to this country and the world. It is an evil that is present in, uh, or usually prevalent in the population or geographical areas at all times. That's the definition of an endemic. Those of us who pastor in communities of color live with its reality on a daily basis. We live with the reality of its continued violence and death and destruction. We see not only the violence in policing, uh, but also the violence of poor housing, uh, poor education, poor health care, echo racism and toxic dump dumping, scarcity of, of nutritious foods, in a word, the lacking in access or what Dave, uh, David Abalos called the lack of vital connections. We live with the disrespect that comes with marginality and invisibility. We are treated as, and the Spanish word is sobrajas, leftovers. People who are just easily discarded because they are considered to have absolutely no inherent worth. How else can we explain a public that is indifferent to the overwhelming loss of indigenous uh, elders um, and with them the loss of traditions and languages and cultural practices due to novel coronavirus? How do we explain the statistics that Latinx and African Americans are hospitalized and die at, uh, of coronavirus at four times the rates of whites? Since this is the topic of spirituality, let me dig a little deeper. Where do we go from here when the novel coronavirus has exposed the societal fissures of not just our economic and political structures, but also of our religious and spiritual assumptions? We live in a globalized world, a world in which neoliberal capitalism, whose primary goal is to gain profit, has infused not only our politics and economics, but also our churches. It has shaped our spiritual formation. This country has developed a tendency to what Daniel Grudy has called money theism. Visa and American Express are our new gods and we daily sacrifice victims to its altar. We prioritize well-being, uh, well-having over well-being. Even churches are too often more concerned for the health of their coffers and the filling up of pews than the transformation of lives of the persons who come broken and searching. We have created, to paraphrase Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a cheap spirituality, a disincarnate and commodified sparkling appendage that provides a false sheen of religiosity without any rigorous demands for justice or intersubjective responsibility, a spirituality preoccupied with ephemeral heavens while being oblivious to the realities of hunger, poverty, suffering, and pain that surround us. It has always struck me that in Matthew 24, 12, Jesus states that in the end times, that love of many will grow cold. A cold love is a selfish love, one that is concerned only with oneself or one's tribe those that look the same or bring gain to one's life. It is a love that arises from a spirituality that is infected with the me virus. Uh, um, uh, Jesus counters this meism by telling the story of the sheep and the goats. Due to the disciples' myopic spirituality, they were only concerned about their inheritance in the kingdom for being faithful. Jesus' response to this spirit of quid pro quo was that the reign's inheritance comprised of the, of the privilege and the honor to feed the poor, visit the incarcerated, be with the sick, and show hospitality to the stranger. On another occasion, a, he told a lawyer that true spirituality meant that one was not to ask who is my neighbor, but rather to inquire to, to, uh, um, to inquire who is one being neighbor to. At a time in which churches are protesting closures because they're more concerned about their rights 
then their responsibilities to care for the well-being for at-risk parishioners, where people take to the streets with AK-47s to protest being muzzled by masks, where corporations continue to reap billions in profits while Congress takes months to debate whether to give $600 to people who are without food, without shelter, or without hope. We are seeing the results of a false spirituality, one infected with money theism and me theism. To move forward, the church must respond not with a cheap spirituality whose love is cold, but a true spirituality. A true spirituality is permeated with passionate love that seeks justice, loving kindness, and mercy. It weeps for every life that is precious before God. It is deeply concerned for the poor, the ostracized and the forgotten, the underemployed and underinsured, the hungry, the evicted, the sick, those who cannot distance, those who cannot nourish themselves, the generation of children whose futures are being impacted for the indigenous, for the Asian, for the black and brown children who are being killed by poverty, hate, illness, and despair for a planet that we keep exploiting and destroying as if it were our plaything. To move forward, we need to understand profoundly that God's vision for community, for the oikonomia, if you will, the household and economy of God, and for creation is contrary to the very structures of profit and exploitation in which we live. This, I believe, was Martin Luther King's vision for the beloved community that inspired so many to envision to see where we go from here. Thank you. And let the church say amen. If you were, yeah. if you were not the embodiment of Karl Barth's preaching with a newspaper in one hand and a Bible in the other, I don't know what it is. Thank you for those opening comments, Dr. Martell. Dr. Miller, come on. Wow, I want to say an amen, an, uh, an amen, an amen, an am, amen. We are joining with the heavens right now. As we gather in worship together, one of the proclamations right at the heart of the Eucharist, right at the heart of the communion, is this joining of heaven and earth. And the heaven and earth and the community of heaven and earth have joined us in this conversation right now. This is a thin space. And Dr. Martell, thank you. Thank you for being a mouthpiece of that thin space. And thank you for the honor of being together and gathered together. Where are we? Where are we as a nation? Where are we as a church? And where are we as individuals as we gather together today? Where are we? We are being run by our fears and the metastasization of racism, of white supremacy, and of wounds and things that have been done in our history that we have not tended. We have looked for change, but not transformation. Change changes may change initial behaviors. Transformation changes something far deeper. It gets at our values. It gets at what motivates us. Worship broadly speaking, is the giving of our allegiance. Spirituality and spiritual formation gets at what's driving those allegiances. We have touched too long of putting a Band-Aid and addressing behaviors or even addressing how we talk about those behaviors instead of getting at the heart, at the core, at the deeper reality that is going on not only in the soul of an individual, but in the soul of a whole society. And we have missed that. And I represent that because in acad academia and in theological academia, we have divorced our thinking, our feeling, our formation. We've even said there's first order theology and there's second order theology. We bought into these divorces that keep us from looking at what is really driving, really driving the depth of fear that we face <clears throat> in our society right now. And as a white woman, 
who is speaking with you. The depth of fear that we need to face as whites and touch as white people is what is it that needs to be released or that we need to be exorcised from? In the early church, exorcisms were happening for materialism over a long period of time. Now, it wasn't a big shazam. It was this long, long work of formative and transformative work until somebody was moved or shifted away from materialism to be their God. We have a cultural context that has normed and has framed those norms in public policies, in the way we build cities, in the way we even have people in places and bodies in places. And as whites, it is our role to take off our armor. And Christianity actually can put us in the position of helping us learn how to put on a very different armor. And what we are being sold today is based on a fear-based, me-based, selfish-based, I have to cling on to something based, lest I lose what I don't feel like I have in the first place based. Divorce from the God who stoops low among us and recreates afresh and says leadership is from below. If we look at the context, and I'm specifically speaking to white people right now, including myself, when we look at the context of Jesus' role of leadership, right at the precipice in the Gospel of John, we discover that at the point at which he is getting ready to die, the disciples have not gotten it. And instead of, and he's saying, your hearts are greatly troubled. That is true. And he gets up from the table and he actually takes off his outer robe and he washes the feet of the disciples. And what you will hear from me today is that this kind of embedded tending embodied tending of the body personally will help us through our fear because we need to embed a different formative way in our cultural context. Racism, white supremacy is embedded in us. We swim in it. We are drinking the water every day. And every day is a new discovery, not only of how we're swimming in it and how it's got us, but the deeper call is embedding a different way of how we can, and our body and the body of Christ can enact something different than what's going on. And I believe, I have seen, I have witnessed, and my hope has seen marginalized communities who actually offer us ways out of the very thing that we're stuck in. And this is a great act of hope. This is the goodness of Christ. And even among the disciples who were afraid, jockeying for power, and thinking that the kingdom looked like an overthrow of a government. Instead, Jesus said, you will not get this right now. You're not going to get it until later. Instead, I'm going to have you embody it and enact it. And I'm going to need to take the responsibility and show you what that physically looks like. So instead of God absenting himself or herself, God's self from this group of disciples saying, forget it after three years, a stooping low happened. And today, in a text with a dear colleague, we need to look at the blood we've spilled and we need to see it. One of the phrases Jesus uses over and over and over again, formatively, is do you see this person? It's time to see. It's time to look at the blood we've spilled. And it's time to join in and stoop low. And especially for those of us who are whites, it's time. Let us learn together. Amen. Amen. That was so rich. Um, I come from a Baptist tradition, so I feel like I should do an offering. And a Black church tradition, like right now, we need to take up an offering. Um, but just even to delve deeper into what 
uh, your what both of you have said, and it's so rich. There really is so much that we could, we just don't even have enough time, unfortunately. But um, this whole idea of being in community and the community finding a way, um, Dr. Miller, you're, you're, it sounds like you're saying that marginalized communities can help lead um, white folks into what, what God's kingdom really being on earth. And that is one way that you can see. Um, Dr. Martell talked about leftovers and how the, the distortions that have happened. Um, and so I'm wondering um, in just really profound ways. So I'm wondering how do we, as a community of believers, there are so many who don't wanna see, uh, so many who don't want to hear, so many who um, have turned a blind eye. And, and some of those people, ended up at the Capitol last Wednesday, um, unfortunately. And it's interesting that right now, we're a week from January 6th and a week before the inauguration, right? So we're really in this in-between place where um, we have to make some decisions even about how we're gonna move forward. And so I wonder as a community of faith, how do we help people, I don't even know of help or how do we move? How do we, you talked about Dr. Miller, um, changing versus transformation. How do we begin to see that transformation happening? What are we able to do from our own um, spaces and social location to help to move that, uh, move it forward so that we can not still be in the same place a year from now or uh, five or 10 years down the road? Um, I, Dr. Martell, you can go first and then Dr. Miller, it's on. do it like that. Um, <clears throat> well, I, I, I think that um, we, we need to stop looking for overnight responses. Um, we are where we are um, over a, a lifetime, right? Uh, generations. Um, uh, when I teach my students, I, I always like to uh, refer to Ephesians 4, uh, because Ephesians 4 has some very interesting language. It talks about the gifts of the Spirit, and it talks about how God calls these different ministries and these different people with these different gifts. Um, and, and it uses the language in the English, it's translated to equip the saints. And I looked up that word and I did some, you know, some, something that theologians normally don't do, which is I did exegesis of the text. And, uh, and, and, and it's interesting because the word that it used there is katartismos. And katartismos literally means healing the fractures, healing the broken bones. And um, for some of you who don't know, my background, and that's why you see a microscope behind me. My background is in veterinary medicine. So, um, so there are different kinds of fractures and um, there's a simple fracture and you can MacGyver that and get a good ro roll of newspaper and a rubber band and put it together and please don't do that at home, but you know, you could basically do that and it'll heal. And <clears throat> there's, a <clears throat> there's a comminuted fracture, which is multiple fractures and that needs a little more care, professional care. And then there's something called a compound fracture and it's a compound fracture when a fracture breaks through the skin, and that means that there's all kinds of systems that have been hurt in that fracture. So whenever I see that text, that we need multiple gifts because there's a fracture that needs to be healed, I think of a compound fracture. And, and the compounding here is that it's generational. We have had generations of fractures that are going on, generations of breaks. So if we think that we can go in there and MacGyver it and tell people, you know, do as Jesus would do or accept Jesus or Lord and Savior and it's gonna take care of the fracture, we are sadly mistaken because we don't understand then that, that there's systems and generations and layers and nuances that have been damaged so it's, it's complex, right? So for us to fix this, it's complex. We've already malformed people in this country, at least, into thinking that, um, that Christianity is like capitalism. 
It's a quid pro quo. I say yes to Jesus and I get a whole, I, I, you know, I, I hit the casino. I get a whole slew of gold coins come back at me. And so if you're now going to say to me that you're going to take away my gold coins, hey, I'm going to bring out my AK-47. Now I'm going to shoot you down for my, right? And this is what we're seeing, this violence. Uh, we bring up our, our children on violence. Um, whenever there's an international disagreement, what's the first thing we do? We go to war and we celebrate that. So we, we've grown up already malformed. And, and now we want to say to people, oops, oh, it's, it's, no, it's not supposed to work this way. Let's fix it. Let's put a Band-Aid. Let's sing, let's sing Kumbaya and hold hands and lift up our hands, and we should take care of it that way. We have to now start a whole system of reformation, of healing those fractures, of thinking differently, right? Um, I, I, uh, I grew up when, in, when I, I grew up in Puerto Rico, and whenever people would talk about church, they would never say, we're going to church. It was interesting. In Spanish, they would always say, we're going to the service. We're going to the service. So I grew up with this idea that the church was a place where I had to go serve. And I hear people nowadays going, well, that church doesn't do it for me. And I'm going like, doesn't do it for you. It's, it's about service, right? It's, it's, about, it's not about what they're going to do for you. It's about God, God is calling you that, to that place because there's things that you need to do in the Lord. So how do we reform people? How do we reshape people? It's interesting. Um, 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 Irenaeus, a, a church father, when he talked about salvation, uh, he would talk about that Christ came, that Christ, it was important that Christ came as a baby and went through all the steps of life because in each step, Christ would recapitulate, that Christ would redo humanity because humanity was deformed, right? So how do we allow the spirit to redo, to reform, reform our faith, reform how we look at each other, reform how we understand church, how we understand community, how we understand service, that life isn't about quid pro quo, that 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 it is about um, but about serving. I have a quote. I did a research on spirituality uh, some years back, and it was very interesting. A grassroots woman in the church. I asked her, "What is spirituality for you?" And she said to me, "Spirituality is understanding that there is something greater than myself." How can we get people to think about politics? and community and life about being something greater than themselves. So that masking isn't a po political statement or, a, or a taking away of your rights, but it is about caring for your neighbor. It's, it's an act of love rather than, an act, and than a political statement. How, you know, how do, so how do we reshape people? How do we reshape our spirituality? Dr. Miller. Thank you. I would start with time as well um, first. Um, so I really appreciate that it takes time. In every program that I work with in any way, shape or form, whether it's a spiritual guidance and justice in the neighborhood program, um, or whether I'm working in a master's program as I do, um, any program I work with, we look at it over time and tend it over time. Transformation, formation is, these are the building blocks that offer sustenance over time. We form the child in the ways they should go. This is very much the call in Deuteronomy. Transformation is a change in that formation. And the two have everything and nothing to do with one another. <laughs> um, and so <laughs> we form at the service, as Rosemary Houghton says, of transformation. We form at the service of transformation, the change in formation. And change in formation takes time. One, we acknowledge 
that we need spaces for this transformation to occur. We need to create spaces for this transformation where it's more likely to occur. This will not happen um, by the great divorces that we have, including the divorce that says, look, hey, you know, I have friends who are black, therefore I'm not racist. What happens in that statement alone is a defense mechanism that's going on. And I've started a conversation, but not really, I've shut one down, but I've not looked at the layers below. And spaces for transformation are spaces where we unpack what's really going on layer by layer by layer. Where am I at? Where are we at? What has formed me? What's happening underneath there? And what's my identity? What level of choice do I, do we, have we exercised within that? And who am I and who's God? And all of those layers are multifaceted layers of learning how to listen, not only what's going in our own lives, but in the life of the communities around us. And so, first of all, that takes time and it takes great care and it takes great love. We do that though, and this is where it's a misnomer for me as a white woman. I'm trained in the area of um, worship and spirituality, background in social work. Um, I used to think 25 years ago when I started as a spiritual director and um, a pastor um, that my goal was to get peace. I mean, I come from an Anabaptist tradition after all, and we are peace people. But one of our faults is peace at all costs, which really isn't peace, um, which isn't <laughs> in our origin stories. It wasn't peace at all costs either. <laughs> but peace at all costs is not really peace. And I used to think, oh, if I can have greater peace, if the person can have greater peace when they leave me, the misnomer, the thing that I was missing that took me time to realize formatively, but also learning how to listen layer by layer by layer to my story, to the person's story, to the community story, to God's story, all of these layers was, oh, we're living in the cancer of racism. I'm equipping somebody to go have peace in the midst of that, what? So, so that is when I realized I, as a scholar, as a formative work, needed to learn from communities what are the muscles being used that actually help form building blocks of overcoming in the midst of the cancer that is an act of peacemaking and operating differently in a world that says otherwise. And so it had me become a learner of a different way. And by the way, this is who the early Christians were called in Acts and also the people that were turning the world upside down, people of the way. It was a different way. And one of the things I noticed and named during Epiphany on the very day of the insurrection and violent incited insurrection in our nation's capital, we marked a day that pagan magi came and were, were blown away by these signs and couldn't figure them out and encountered a toddler of some sort, we don't fully know the age, and were changed in their formation and something happened that they went back to their own land a different way. And we need to go back to our land in a different way. And so how, um, over a long period of time, um, please, please look for centers, retreat centers that connect justice and spirituality together and how we work in the neighborhood <laughs> and how we listen to our own neighborhoods, but also that help us over the long period of time, the slow work in ourselves and that God and the spirit are doing to slowly be able to see what's going on in our own lives. And it's one thing to address the external, and it's another thing to address the internal that's driving it. These are not separated out. 
And this is the confession. This is another action is confession. We need to bring confession and lament forward into the church. And we also need to find a space where white guilt, which is very real, and immediately we want to shove it down, has a place to be lamented and voiced so that we can have grounds, or as Ruby Sales says, we can ask the question, where does it hurt? So that we have grounds to be able to open our ears to start to listen, even to different frames of reference. Our ability, you look at Gottman Marriage Therapy, and they say that as soon as our heart rates increase by 10 beats per minute, the ability to hear one another has been severely and, and has shifted. During trauma, our ability to cope and our mechanisms for coping, we rely on the basements of our lives. So if we think of ourselves as a house, and a framework as a house. In the living room are my frames of reference that I'm used to, I'm comfortable with, it has the furniture I grew up with. And by the way, I changed that one because I don't like my parents anyway. And this one and that one, and whatever that is in our living rooms of our lives. Most of our work in theology schools is in the workshop. <laughs> and most of the work in our society is getting people that are, have a living room kind of like my own and we connect with one another and we go to church together. And now what's being revealed is we haven't really learned and how do we learn and get at what's going on in my living room. I can talk workshop space, I can play with that, but the reality is it is impacting people's living rooms all over the world. And finally, we actually move to the layer of the basement and that takes a long period of time. That's the history. So we begin with a slow process, we confess, we love, we find places that are willing to do the long work with us in that, to be accompanied. We gaze and learn with communities of overcomers rather than marginalizing overcomers. What does it mean that the muscles that have been embedded in this person may assist me. Racism is embedded. Child in the, mother in the elevator with child. Okay, racism gets embedded in our bodies. Infant, black man steps on elevator. She grabs infant tighter. She grabs toddler tighter later on. She grabs the child as they grow up. Embedded in the body of that child is that Black bodies are unsafe bodies in the elevator. That's embedded in us. I can tell you all sorts of things. I can proclaim it, now go do it, but we're missing the body. And it's no wonder that we have suspicion of brown and black bodies and white bodies when we've missed that it's embedded in us. And that takes time and work but we slowly embed different ways. Very slowly, but practice by practice, we teach, we learn different ways to embed things. And this is all over the scriptures, but we just miss it. And we also reclaim a framing of the biblical story again and again and again. The fact that it began in chaos and the Holy Spirit hovers over chaos, and we are in a time of chaos and God is creating right now. It's going to get harder. I assure you, it's going to get harder for our church leaders. It's going to get harder for our lady. It's harder for us. And we are groaning. It's going to get harder. Prepare for the way. Work your muscles. This is what our faith is calling us towards because recreating is happening. It's happening. That's the spirit's work in the midst of the human crap. And I, I want to say a different word in the midst of what we've done to one another and God's creation. This is where God is recreating. It's no accident that John begins, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God in a new creation. And God's doing a new thing but it is going to hurt. It's going to be hard. And it is a sense in which our formative work, 
we have not exorcised ourselves and going back and doing the healing work is the long, slow work. But we need that in very trusted and loving places. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Um, Dr. Uh, Miller, thank you for being a John the Baptist voice in the wilderness for us and giving us our call to action. Um, thank you for that. Thank you for both of your responses to these questions. And it was, uh, and it was Nelson Mandela who said that peace is not uh, just the absence of conflicts, it's the creation of, of an environment to where we all can flourish, regardless of the disparities that we've created. So I want to combine one of the questions that we have in the Q and A um, to the to the practical steps that you all can offer um, in creating. In in well, the question in the uh, Q and A says, um, "How do we bring Frere's uh, critical pedagogy into local churches to improve connections between Christian education and justice?" And so, how do how do we answer that question? And also, how do we go about practically as people of faith individually? As well as in the community of faith within our churches, how do we go? How do we go about this spiritual transformation, the spiritual formation, these formative actions? Dr. Miller, you want to start with us? I think um, two things. I want to make a distinction, distinction, especially for our pastoral leaders who are joining us or viewing this later on. It is one thing to come in and resource for a period of time in a church, and it's another thing to be in the long, slow work in the congregation itself. Those are two different things. Contextualize, contextualize, contextualize. So I want to start there. Know your context well. Learn your context well. Listen to the stories that are repeated in the context. Learn your context's origin stories because it's out of the origins in that context that the healing needs to happen. And that's the beginning process because this is contextualized in the origin story. For example, even denominations split over slavery. We have not reconciled split denominational stories that separated and fought North-South segregation in denominational structures. We haven't addressed it fully. So it's no wonder that our churches are aching because underneath that, so I want to distinguish between churches that are shorter term, is people who resource churches shorter term and longer term. The other is do not underestimate your call to worship in the opening. When we are called into worship, we're called into allegiance. Who are we giving allegiance to and how? And how are we helping that allegiance be embodied or enacted in a different way? We are evoking something, meaning evocare, meaning calling out something in order to be a new people. For example, when Jesus opened the scroll and named his core mission and call to free the oppressed and to turn upside down what people thought was right side up. This was an invoking and an evoking of a very different way. In fact, people wanted to kill him for it in his hometown. We have, right within the scriptures, an embedding of a different way. Another example. I have done <laughs> a whisper in large group convention settings, small group settings that starts before I get up during a worship gathering to welcome people. And the whisper is, it's the year of the Lord's favor. Pass it on. It's the year of the Lord's favor. Pass it on. And I've gotten that in the front row or in that front circle, and then it goes back and back and back. Kind of this giant telephone game. The scripture is starting to be enacted in the hearing of the body of Christ. And we proclaim something in worship, but we also enact something, help people enact a different way. The other is in our congregations, your congregations are quite brilliant. 
Our congregations are quite brilliant. Honor and respect the brilliance of the congregation. Each person, get to know them. Um, I happen to live with a pastor <laughs> um, <laughs> and an elder and an ethicist. <laughs> um, and one of the gifts is discover the gifts of the congregation and build on the gifts that they have. Discover the gifts of the congregation and build on the gifts they have. What tools do you have? Start there. It is an abundance act instead of a scarcity act. That doesn't mean we omit confession because when it comes, every gathering offer confession, not only individual, but communal confessions and offer spaces for those communal confessions. The other is, is learn how, <laughs> and this is something I work with very hard with students at, at Pfeiffer and beyond. Learn how to let go of control, which is using the power that God has given you. The power is the ability to, Learn how to give your ability to control every moment because the spirit of God comes in those spaces that we open up so that the change in formation can actually enter in. This is why listening becomes important. This is why embedding our bodies with a different way and using muscles we don't have becomes important. But local congregations, I also encourage you to reclaim in new ways, um, pathways of Christ that the, the scriptures already have that call us to a very different way. And if you don't know how to discover those, search for the resources, discover, learn, always get support for yourself in the form of a peer group or other peer groups to help you. When I work and listen to people in the long suffering work in not only congregationally, but also activists that deal with violence or standing in the way of violence, um, when they're honest, they have spaces and create spaces that they recognize and we recognize that we have violence within ourselves that we need to address. So even a white male who is working at standing in between in the place of Hebron shared with me that over the long suffering work of being an activist who stands between the rubber bullets, between the military who has the weapons and the people, the Arab people who do not, and he stands physically in between, that as he was learning that some of the military were peeing in the cisterns of the community, and they were caught that he had fantasies of violence that he wanted to do against the military. And he needed to reconcile or learn to address that in the presence of a community while the community is in pain. The other is recognize you will be targeted as a pastor in the midst of not only change, but transformation because we need to target people. We need to target practice on somebody to take out our pain and our anger. And you will become a place of that target practice. I assure you, it's gather a community where you can listen to the pain. You can address the pain. You can discover God and you can love the congregation in new ways and balance that prophetic and wisdom and pastoral connection that's necessary to hold together in a spiritually formative way. Those are just some beginning pieces. Thank you. I just wanna add a couple of things <clears throat> um, uh, from the perspective of a person of color. I uh, pastored in the Bronx for uh, 15 years. Um, and so I, I'm gonna answer that question uh, from that perspective. And I'm going to add, uh, sort of combine that question uh, with something that somebody, a question that somebody put in the chat about, you know, how, how does it that we see people of color participating in those riots and in that kind of a thing? Um, so I, I think that the importance of, of, of helping people think critically um, 
applies both to people of color and to and to white people. Again, um, we are in this matrix of white supremacy. We we uh, and and liberal capitalism. So we've all been uh, participating of that malformation. Um, what I did in my pastorate, um, and this is just a small example, I, I began to realize that um, um, whenever we came to the part of the liturgy where everybody had to sort of stand up and read scripture, you know, you, 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 it became almost um, it, it became almost automatic. You know, please rise. Everybody would rise. Um, uh, open up your Bible. Everybody. You know, I'll read one verse, read them, and you know, somebody read a verse, somebody, and 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 I I'm watching people, and nobody's really thinking about what is this text that you're reading. So I went over to the senior pastor and I said, you know, I, I'd like to, I'd like to take over this part, and he said, sure, sure, go ahead. And so uh, from that point on, I would stand up, and you know, and, and it was interesting. As soon as I hit the pulpit, everybody would just rise. It was it was Pavlovian. It would just rise. And, and and the first time I, I saw that, everybody just didn't know what to do because I said to everybody, please sit down. And everybody was, you don't sit down here. This is not the part where you sit down. Said, just sit down, please. And I said to them, uh, do you know what you're reading? What? And so I started breaking it down. This is a psalm. Does anybody know what a psalm is? What? And so we would have these like little exegetical moments. What's a psalm? It's a song. When is it sung? It's, this is a lament. What does that mean? This is a word of praise. What does that mean? And so I got people to start thinking about what they were reading. Something that simple. Think about what you're reading. How many times don't we listen to the news? We're not thinking about what we're listening. How many times don't we engage in conversations? We're not thinking about the conversation. We just sort of go with the flow. So with just that simple act, think about what you're reading in the text. Think about the context. Think about who said this. Think about why you said this. And, and when people sort of got used to that one time, we came across Psalm 23. And I said, OK, how do I do this with Psalm 23? Because everybody knows Psalm 23. We're just, no matter what I do, everybody's just going to read it automatically. So I said to people, OK, let's do something different today. What I'm gonna ask everybody to do is to sit and to, when you get to a verse that has touched your life, something that echoes and resonates with an experience that, you read, that you've lived, please rise. And it became this moment of worship. You see, because you'd see people go, yet though I walk in the valley and you'd see people rise and then they'd sit. And, and you know, Ituvare tu callado está conmigo. Your 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 staff and your and they rise and they sit and and you'd have this 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 flow thing going. And by the time we finished, people were weeping and people were praising God because they read it with intelligence. They read it, see, and, and like Freire, I didn't tell them what the psalm was about. I didn't tell them what the text was about. I let them encounter the text and I let the spirit speak, but it was done intelligently. So why do you have people of color in mixed in those things? Because they haven't been taught to think critically. Right? They too have been malformed, right? Even in Hitler Germany, we know, in Nazi Germany, we know that there were people who were being oppressed that were um, that were working in complicity with the very government that was oppressing them. We know that happened, right? So we know that there are those mechanisms. So how do we help our congregations? You're right. How do we help our congregations think critically? So one of the things that I think we have to stop doing as pastors and as leaders is to stop spoon feeding our people and stop telling them that faith means to accept blindly. That is exactly what faith does not mean, right? Anselm said that faith is seeking understanding. How do we help our congregations seek understanding? How do we help our, our congregations have the faith and the trust in God's love and fidelity that we can ask hard questions? To ask hard questions doesn't mean to be unfaithful. 
In fact, that means to be faithful. We are seeking to understand. That's Freire's methodology, right? So how do we how do we help? But you see, again, as Dr. Miller said, if we're working out of a place of fear, oh my gosh, if my congregants are smarter than me, they might throw me out. They might challenge my authority, right? So there, if, if we practice a pastorate of authoritarianism, then we're going to have people shaped by authoritarianism. And if they're shaped by authoritarianism, when you have an administration that we've had, they're going to be attracted to that, right? But if we teach people that faith is to ask hard questions, that God doesn't walk away because we challenge and have ask hard questions, and that we teach them how to ask those hard questions in love and in respect, right? Because that's another thing. How do we teach people respect and love? We do that by embodying that, by creating an ethos of love and respect, right? So I think that all of that, I think, is part of Freire's uh, methodology. And I think that then, then that helps people to not fall entrapped by these movements. And, and thirdly, we have to teach people that a linchpin is not one issue, right? We, we flock to this person over one linchpin issue, whatever that issue might be. So if you claim to be the person that respects life, then let's explain to our congregations the Jesus Christ of life, the God of life, and everything that that entails, not just a little piece of what it entails, right? So I think that as we do these things, we help people, A, think critically, but also to ask critically, and thirdly, to not flock automatically to people who are in fads of linchpin issues. That's so rich and, and definitely um, my experience, my testimony is that those moments of questioning really build your faith muscles, right? It's, it's a moment where you meet God and God meets you and you can really grow as a, as a Christian. Um, there's a couple of, a, a, a question I have and a question that is in the chat that I think is really in particular um, key for this moment, uh, someone from Bogus Chapel asked, in the face of trauma in front of us, people dying, how do we do both the prophetic and the slow pastoral he healing work without shortchanging either? And I think one of the things that um, as we were moving into 2021, you know, we do these New Year's resolutions and there's so many people, myself included, who will say next year, this, I'm not going to take this with me. You know, I'm going to leave such and such behind. Sometimes it's people, amen, that you just decide uh, no more of their foolishness or whatever the case may be. But one of the things that we were not able to leave in 2020 is grief, right? And so, we're watching, we are, we are living in trauma, I would say, as we see COVID numbers and so many are infected and affected, so many families. I think 4,300 people, my God, died yes, just yesterday. There's so much around us in addition to what we may be dealing with in our own lives. And so the issue of dealing with the trauma, I think, and the grief that we're all um, experiencing, even corporate grief um, as a nation. How do we, how do we deal with that? What do we do? What are some ways that we sustain ourselves spiritually in the midst of all of this? Uh, okay, yes, Dr. Martel, if you will. I wasn't sure. Who and then we'll who, go to Dr. Martel. Okay. So it, this is a question that I have been really pondering on for many reasons, because um, um, I have dealt grief in my own personal life. Uh, uh, my father passed away in 2016, and, um, and I'm still dealing uh, in unexpected moments with that grief. And believe it or not, the events of the past uh, two weeks have sort of brought back, slammed me back with that grief unexpectedly. So those moments hit you. Um, a colleague of mine, a beloved colleague, the former dean of LTS, just passed away 
on the 31st. So I have been dealing with personal grief. I have been uh, trying to walk with my students and staff and others as they deal with um, with issues in their lives. A very good friend of mine just lost her father yesterday. So as this issue of grief is a very, it's a very personal one for me. Um, and it's one that um, it is, um, it's very personal. Um, and so one of the things I've learned about grief is that you can't put it away. It, you, you walk with it, you, you process it, you, you walk with it every day. And there are days that you can walk okay. And there are days that you don't want to get out of bed. Uh, and there are days that you just sit in a corner and you bawl your eyes out. And, and that that's okay. That, that you shouldn't go around saying, well, I'm, I'm a pastor. I'm a spiritual person. I'm a, I'm a leader. And darn it. Gosh, darn it. I, you know, I should know better. So, you know, let me put on my big person pants and give an example to the world. You know, we, this, that's not, even Jesus wept when his good friend Lazarus died. You know, we, grief is real and we, we live through it. We listen to our bodies when our bodies say, you know, today I, I don't have, don't have the strength. I just, just don't have the strength for it. I, I don't want to be smart. I don't want to be wise. Don't want to be spiritual. Just want to sit here. So you do that. So, I mean, be human to yourself. Be humane to yourself and do that. That's real. The one thing that sustains me, believe it or not, is a, is a, is a text that I came across when I was in seminary. And I had to do an exegesis on it. Gee, that's the third exegesis. These theologians, darn it. Um, I was reading this wonderful text in Habakkuk, and it said, the just shall live by faith. You all know this text. You know it from Romans. The just shall live by faith. But when I started reading it in the Hebrew, something very different came up for me, you see. Because in the Hebrew, the, the, the bulk of that text is, um, and you got to remember, this is Habakkuk, and, he, and he's angry. Why is he angry? Because the political and religious leaders of the time were oppressing people. And because there was an army that was going to attack. So there's this military, right? So very much like our conditions. And, and Habakkuk goes to God and, going, and says, where the heck are you? And what the heck are you doing for this? Can't you see that there are people suffering and dying? Where, what is wrong with you, right? And so, and so Jesus, and God says to Habakkuk, be patient. The, the vision that I have is going to be fulfilled. And, and, so, and, and in, that, in that conversation, God says to Habakkuk, the just shall live by faith. But the, the bulk of that, of that verse says, look at the proud. And, and the word for proud there is crooked neck. Look at the crooked neck. They have no breath in them. So the, the breath in, in the Hebrew nomenclature is throat. So think of little chicks, little birds. How do they, right? They stretch out, they stretch out and they're waiting for mama to feed them. So if, you're, if, you're, if your neck is crooked, you can't breathe and you can't be fed. So the just are the ones whose necks are always straight. And the word faith there is ambiguous. It, you're not sure if it means the faith of God because it's fidelity. The just shall live by fidelity. Whose fidelity? The just faith or God's fidelity? And I think the ambiguity is purposeful. The just, the straight neck will always survive because they trust in God's breathing for them, but they, but they, so it's their faith in staying straight, but it's also God's faith in breathing for them. God will always, always give us breath and God's breath is always breathing. But if we're crooked, we can't receive it. You see, God will always feed us. God will always breathe for us. When we have no strength, keep your neck straight. So no matter what storm is beating around, no matter how people are yelling around, no matter who's falling, 
even when you're in, in the depth of grief, don't crook your neck. You see, all those people who are yelling and screaming and shooting, and their necks are crooked. They're not breathing. Here's the third piece. If you're straight necked, you not only receive air, then you become conduits of the spirit to receive air and become a conduit of breath for others. That's what it means to be spiritual. So what do we do with our grief? We acknowledge it, but we don't get crooked necks. Remain with straight necks. Grief is a gift. And you have named so profoundly the gift of grief and where it turns us. Um, so I want to start there. Grief is a signal that it hurts, that we are alive and it hurts. And we carry grief in our bodies. And we have multiple wounds and multiple griefs and multiple layers of it that we carry. And one, again, allow the scriptures, the Psalms are a great place to start to help open us to be allowed to grieve. I think there's so much trauma happening that at least in my own journey, when there's grief upon grief upon grief upon grief, then what do I do with it all when I've got a function over here? One, be aware of what you're parking, <laughs> but eventually it cannot be parked, it comes out. So honor, recognize that you have grief, grief. open up spaces where people can grieve. Um, I know that, um, so that's another piece in terms of grief. Um, I also think we need community grievers and recognizing who has this gift in community. Certainly in Ireland, we even have people who do calling out in terms of grief. And I remember um, doing a funeral. It was a very complex funeral. Um, and grieving, people didn't want to, to grieve because it was most likely a suicide unless we reveal this. And I was helping with that funeral. And the way of coping was, let's not sing. And this is a family in an African-American community and we're singers, we sing, we sing our faith, but don't sing. And I knew grief was happening and people wanted to shut it down, lest that come forth. And how do we work with that? So here's a compounding grief upon grief in an incredible person. And I used a physical means to open us to that in prayer. And when I was asked to offer the prayer, and I knew what I was doing, which was taking a very large risk and crying out, this person happened to be a carer for the birds and would put up signs in the church that said, feed the birds in the wintertime. So I brought bird seed, a big pan of bird seed to the funeral. And I put it there. And... I had it so that people could take a piece, some bird seed when we went and did the burial and spread bird seed out everywhere, all over the ground. But this grief was getting stifled of a child of God who's a profound leader in the community who had changed lives over and over and certainly changed mine. And so in that, I gave space for grief by using the prayer that is so gifted in this community. And I cried out, oh God. And I dipped my hands after sharing the bird story into the bird seed and I spread it out. And I said, oh God, this hurts, we miss. And I shared his name. And I acknowledged the grief of the community giving it permission to come out in a permissive way. And the wails began from the front and the family all the way to the back and out the doors where people were gathered outside. This is the impact this person had in the community. And it gave space for grief, but also 
learn to acknowledge and recognize the weepers in our community. There are people who weep. There are people who weep. When I went to one of my trainings at the Beloved Community Center for a day, I sat there nearly weeping all day long. And all we were doing was listening to where people hurt. And I was angry because people were stiff necked and talking about their white fragility. And I was angry and I was hurt. And I was like, do you know that the person who stands before us, who's listening to our pain, has actually experienced pain over and over and over again and is in their 70s listening to our belly aching? And I was weeping. I was grieving that we weren't getting it, but we were being shown a love that far surpassed anything that we could have encountered in that moment. And I was weeping. I was noticing the grief, but also what was happening is healing starts to happen when it's allowed to be released in places where you form places to set up places of transformation. And that takes tending and time and curating. We are in a society that manipulates those places and incites people in those vulnerable spaces. And spiritual formation says, no, we will learn to tend that sacred space and we will hold it and we will die to hold the sacred space of the dignity for every person created in the image of God. We will hold that space. We will pledge that kind of love and grief needs space. And we are going to need to open those spaces for our healthcare workers who have been maligned over and over again, who are on nonstop. When we are stuck in a trauma context, our ability in that fight or flight gets stuck. We have no means of coming down. And our research has shown us for Holocaust survivors, particularly two who are in the same household, that the DNA is changed of the children and the grandchildren of the Holocaust survivor out of that traumatic. They've located what that kind of trauma does to the fight or flight and getting stuck in that in our brains. We have a whole society on that right now, right now, right now. And it's getting compounded. Holding space for grief. And starting small with two, with three, with four. Because we begin a meal that we mark until the return of Christ that says, on the night in which he was betrayed. That is the beginning of that meal. <laughs> it's in betrayal. It's in trauma. It's in horror. And it's in grief. But always know that the spirit of God will shine. When I have worshiped at the wall, Tijuana, San Diego area in Friendship Park and Tijuana, both sides, what I have learned is that as we pass the peace and come up to that wall at 1.30 on Sundays in non-COVID times and in the time when we're allowed, especially on the U.S. side, that there's no more space to get through the wall anymore. When you get up close, it's a teeny grid. But we pass the peace by putting our pinky or our finger up to the wall, flesh to flesh, binationally, and we touch each other. We are touched into existence, writes Miroslav Wolf, received. We have lost the ability, and, and that's why touch, mal touch is so horrific because it says we don't exist as a person. This is in the midst of trauma and grief. We are touching one another and we are passing the peace and acknowledging one another's humanity in the presence of Christ. This is holding open a space. This is acknowledging grief, but it's also touching something else into existence that God's saying, it's here, I'm here. So those are pieces, little windows to help you into grief, but also who are your grievers in the congregation, in your contexts? How might their gifts come forth and how might you open up spaces 
so that we can grieve and mourn. I would also encourage you to find a symbol or a marker, <laughs> communion perhaps, <laughs> but a marker to hold forth in your spaces, in your homes, in your congregations that marks grief. I've had people use bowls of water just to touch water and recognize that their tears are being poured out. I've had people dip their hands in water. Um, what is that that shows we've got colossal grief and, and we're not just shelving it, it's present with us. And marking that physically is important for the body and the body of Christ. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Thank you both. On behalf of the National Council of Churches, I want to thank you both for this enriched, engaging, and informative conversation. Um, it's... It, it, you all have given us the why and the how and the what. Now it's time for us to go do. So I greatly thank you all um, for giving the marching orders. And for those who have dared just to, to hang with us uh, still, even though we're running a little bit behind, um, thank you all for uh, viewing the conversation here with us and, and, and engaging in this courageous conversation. And please do know that um, uh, the conversation will be rebroadcast on the National Council of Churches uh, Facebook page as well as YouTube page um, tonight at 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. And there you can ask, you can also see our previous conversations on our YouTube and Facebook page. And please stay tuned. Uh, keep informed with the National Council of Churches. Go to our website, nationalcouncilofchurches.us, and uh, check out for, uh, watch for further conversations as well as uh, sign up for our uh, updates and whatnot. So you can stay informed with the work that the National Council of Churches is doing. Um, Dr. Martell, Dr. Miller, bless you for being um, a prophetic, profound, just, just peace givers, peacemakers in the kingdom and, and keep doing what you're doing. I, I love you, I, I'm praying for you. And at the end of this conversation, since we're ending right now, Dr. Martell, will you please close us out in prayer? Thank you. It's been a pleasure to be with all of you. It's really, truly been a blessing. Uh, let's go to, uh, to the Lord in prayer. Señor, levantamos palabra a ti, dándote gracias por tu grandeza y por tu misericordia y porque tú eres el Dios de aire y de respiro, de consuelo y de fortaleza. We thank you, Lord, because we go before you thanking you and recognizing you as the God of breath and of life and of hope and of resurrection and of strength. We thank you for these moments of dialogue and conversation. We thank you, Lord, because we know that we are in a moment of Kairos, that significant things are happening around us. We also pray that in the time that we've been together, that perhaps someone here in this group participating, listening, has also received a word, a timely word of hope and of strength and of possibilities. We pray for our leaders as they take a significant um, vote today. We pray for the leadership as they face an inauguration. We pray, Lord, that you cover this nation in your grace. We pray, Lord, that any any strength, any uh, uh, forts that lift up against you, as it says in Corinthians, that you submit them to the love and the mind of Christ, that you bring peace to this nation. We pray for healing, Lord, for the people who have been so affected by this pandemic. We pray for those who are grieving for their losses. We pray, Lord, that you give us breath, for truly we are running out of breath. You are spirit and you are life. Fill us with life and fill us with life because we are to be a light unto the world. Help us to fulfill that calling and that mission in this very critical time in the world and in this nation. Thank you for this space, for this conversation and for each person that you brought here. We pray a special blessing for Reverend Watkins, for Reverend Dr. Copeland, and for Dr. Uh, Miller. Thank you for their presence and for their wisdom. We lift all these things in gratitude 
And we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Some show, some hate.